Uh, this is very interesting because, you know, um, I, I, I don't know the English word, but I remember uh, a book of uh, Jeff Zaig, uh, Ericsson, An Introduction to the Man and His Works, I think is the uh, English book. And um, it talked about Ericsson's work as the um, uh, common sense therapy. I don't know if uh, it's uh, the good word uh, in, in English. It's a good word for English. It's the right word, sorry. In English, um, a common sense therapy, a good sense therapy, and it means that it means that sometimes it's more simple than we think. Um, it's more uh, going on the observation of what we uh, or who we have uh, um, in front of us. You know, uh, you're saying some, something like that. So here's where Ericksonian therapy becomes different from other therapies. Mm. Uh, most of our other popular therapies now, like say cognitive behavioral therapy, uh, they're all structured around the understanding of how the conscious mind works. And it's kind of assumed that the only real incredible knowledge that you have to work with is whatever you're consciously aware of. Mm. Uh, and Ericksonian therapy is not structured that way. Uh, there is conscious understanding and there's value in conscious understanding, but Ericksonian therapy also emphasizes the importance of reason uh, and uh, decision-making and emotions and evaluations that are taking place outside of conscious awareness. Yeah. And so the idea is when you sit in front of a person your conscious awareness may pick up on 72 different details. And in the time that you've been able to pick up on 72 different details and consciously kind of notice that, uh, your unconscious mind or subconscious has picked up on uh, perhaps anywhere between 6,000 to 10,000 details. Uh, some of them subliminal. Yeah. Uh, some of the movements too subtle for your conscious mind to recognize or even sounds that your conscious is outside the threshold conscious awareness, but your subconscious is taking in all this information uh, and it's, it's, it's comparing it, it's looking into your catalog of life experiences, any, anything, you, any person you've ever spoken to, anything you've ever seen, and, and it's very rapidly, much, much, much faster than what the conscious mind can do. Mm. Uh, it's analyzing and sorting through all this data. And so for Ericksonian therapy, it's not only valid to trust your intuition it's considered a very important part of interacting intelligently with the person in front of you so i may be consciously aware i may be thinking you know i've got a fiduciary relationship i need to meet the needs of this person in front of me this woman looks very scared and nervous uh, i need to help her feel less scared and nervous and my conscious mind is thinking that uh, but for some reason i just start talking about life on the farm and i start talking about uh the joy of going behind a barn and uh, having your own little fort back there, something where no one can find you. It's a safe place. We're away from the rest of the world. And the person looks at you just in shock and awe. Uh, and, and then after you kind of talk for a little, they say, you know, I grew up on the farm hmm. and I had this fort behind the barn where I would run and I, you know, and they're they're It's as if someone just read their mind and who knows how you're, your unconscious picked up on it. It's something about the way they walk. I, I remember once I was at a, I was at a store. I just started studying Erickson. I was still like uh, young, out of college, and I started reading about Erickson. I was fascinated by what he said about observing people. So I just started observing people. Like I was in the mall, and a, a girl was uh, uh, ringing me up at a register at a very fancy clothing store, and I said, "Can I make some guesses about you?" And uh, I'm just testing myself. And she was like, "Sure." And I said. Uh, you're a college student, right? And she kind of smiled and she was like, yes. And uh, that was kind of an obvious guess because of her age. And she just kind of looked and sounded intelligent. And I was like, you go to such and such university. And she was like, yes. And that was also kind of obvious because that university was kind of, there was three or three universities in this is Dallas, but but this one was kind of a, you could guess that. And I said, is, uh, is your major chemistry? And then she stepped back and started looking around like this unnerved her. 
And she was like, how did you know this? And I didn't know at first how I knew her major. And I kind of thought about it. I had to wait for a while. And then it came to conscious awareness. I was like, oh, it's the way you took my credit card. Because she picked up my credit card and there was a machine to swipe it. And as she was moving the credit card and swiping it, she was holding it so that it was perfectly level. And that's how uh, uh, people that work in labs are trained to do the test tubes so they don't spill them. Uh, there's a special way of holding things. Yeah. And I was in a, a chemistry class in high school and it, it must have just, you know, it registered that her movements, her hands looked like she'd been trained to work in a lab. And so, uh, you know, it's not mind reading, but yeah. it, it's little things happening like that there's there's too many of them for the conscious mind to keep track of and the conscious mind can't go through that much memory that quick but the subconscious can and so if you're tuned into that you can take a, if you can know without asking a person that perhaps they contemplated killing themselves hmm. two days ago or you know these things that take you to really deep powerful conversations very quickly yeah oh uh this is amazing and um, it, give me, it gives me a hint for another question because, you know, um, there is a lot of talk about deliberate pre practice, you know, uh, in the last years. I mean, um, uh, therapists can be better therapists uh, practicing their skills, um, of course, during the, the sessions, but also outside. The session side uh, the office so um what you would suggest to improve our skills to be um uh, more capable to uh, build uh, alliance and relationships with uh, with patients with clients uh, inside the the office and outside the office so what could be a, a good training you, you know what i mean I stopped doing my thing where I came up to strangers and started telling them about themselves because I found it was too disturbing for individuals and they were uh, wanting to call the police or something. It was just too intrusive. Okay. Uh, so I, I rarely do that now. Although I did, my son and I were recently, he was going off to college. Before we went off to college, we were going to travel backpack around Europe. And I said, let's play a game where we see if we can guess a person's name in, in three guesses. And so we would come up to a stranger and we'd be like, can I try to guess your name in three guesses? And the, the first time I did it, I did get the person's name. The person's name was David and I got it in third guess. And uh, it was fun uh, to then sit down and kind of explain to my son how we did it. And the, the, that, when we say we're playing a game and it was a father son, that didn't disturb people. But when I just approached people out of the blue and started telling them about themselves, it really disturbed them. Uh, I had one uh, early on when I was testing this with clients, I thought, what will happen if I have a, a couple come in and they're uh, for marriage couple at counseling and I, uh, I tell them not to tell me anything about themselves during the first 15 or so minutes of the therapy. I'm just going to tell them about themselves. I'm going to tell them how their fights go, who, who starts the fights, who ends the fights, where, you know, each other's behavior. Yeah. And just the ways they were sitting on the couch uh, and uh, how they greeted me and so forth, you could kind of tell some of the dynamics that were going on with their... Uh, their attachment styles. And so uh, there's these patterns that I was consciously aware of, and then I was relying some on intuition. And uh, I, I spent about 15 minutes explaining to them uh, how things are and then what they wanted help with. And uh, after I was finished, I was like, is there anything I was wrong on? And they said, no. I said, is there anything that I missed or that should be improved? And they're like, no, that is, that is it. And so I felt kind of proud of myself. I was like, you know, I, these, these intakes can be much quicker now rather than me having to listen, you know, two or three sessions for people to explain everything to me. I'll just explain to them all in the first 10 or 15 minutes. But that, that, that couple, right after they verified that everything I said was correct, they almost kind of changed the subject, kind of started arguing amongst one another, never brought the conversation back to me and then left therapy and then never returned. Mm. And then I kind of realized you know, I'm, I'm trying to skip an important step. <laughs> and, and one really important thing is for people to have the experience of, of allowing you to get to know them and of, of taking the risk of sharing things. And there's, there's, a, there's a flow and a process. Uh, and so I've decided 
since then that it's it's much wiser to sometimes keep some of your knowledge to yourself mm. uh, and still asking yourself that question in this fiduciary relationship is it is it benefiting my needs to show how much I, I know about them and I can tell about them or is it benefiting their needs I need to make sure it's benefiting their needs does this person need this right now and is this helping them get where they're trying to get